Hello chess fans, this is Rick from Chess to Impress. As I'm recording this video on the 19th of February 2021, the resumption of the 2020-2021 candidates tournament is only two months away. On the 19th of April, these eight players will start battle again in Yekaterinburg in Russia. From the top left, Fabiano Kaurana, the last challenger to world champion Magnus Carlsen. There's Ding Li Ren, Alexander Grishuk, Jan Nepomnichy. The bottom row from the left, Maxime Vashilagrav, who was a late replacement for Timur Rajabov, who dropped out because of the corona pandemic threat. Anish Giri, Wang Hao and Kirill Alexeyenko. They played half the tournament in March 2020 at one stage. This tournament was the only sporting event that was still going on. But it got cut short halfway because of the corona pandemic. Russia was going to close its borders. So there was a danger that the players could not get home. It was rescheduled for November 2020 but postponed again. And as said, the great news is that it has been rescheduled now for April 2021. I got this screenshot from the chess.com website and I got this one from the chess24 website and that is the standings after round 7, so halfway. Two players are leading the candidates tournament, Maxime Vachelagraf and Jan Nepomnichy. Four players a full point behind, Kaurana, Giri, Wang Hao and Grishuk. And Ding Li Ren and Kirill Alexienko need a miracle to win the candidates tournament and become Magnus Carlsen's next challenger. This candidates tournament is the 29th in history and on Chess to Impress we're counting down to towards the resumption of this great event by looking at the 28 earlier candidates tournaments in the history of chess. It all started in London 1883 where Zuckertort and Steinitz finished in the first two places and they played the first official World Championship match three years later. In St. Petersburg 1895-1896, Willem Steinitz, the first official world champion, gained the right for a rematch against world champion Lasker. And it was Paul Keres who won the tournament in the Netherlands in 1938 to qualify for a world championship match against world champion Aljechin. He never got that match because of World War II interfering. Budapest and Moscow 1950 was won by David Bronstein and he challenged world champion Botvinnik for the title one year later. Vasily Smyslov won two candidate cycles, Zurich 1953, a very famous tournament that was, and Amsterdam 1956. Misha Tal won Yugoslavia 1959 and it was his turn to play against Botvinnik. Tigran Petrosian won Curaçao 1962 and beat Botvinnik the year after. Boris Pasky won two candidate cycles in 1965 and 1968. And Bobby Fischer beat Tigran Petrosian in Buenos Aires 1971 to earn the right to challenge Spassky for the match of the century one year later. Anatoly Karpov won Moscow 1974, qualified to play Fischer. Fischer did not want to play and Karpov became world champion by default. Viktor Korchnoi won the next two cycles and lost to Karpov in a world championship match both times. Garry Kasparov came on the scene in 1984 and became the world champion one year later. Karpov came back, won the two next cycles and played a total of five world championship matches against Kasparov. Nigel Short beat Karpov and then beat Timon to become the next challenger of Kasparov. That one is in red because we're going to look at the game from that cycle. Anand was Kasparov's next challenger and Shirov beat Kramnik in Kasorla 1998 and should have been Kasparov's next challenger. Shirov never got a match, Kramnik did and became the 14th world champion in the year 2000. Peter Leko won Dortmund 2002 and challenged Kramnik for the world title two years later. Aron Jan, Gelfan, Grishuk and Leko qualified from Elisa 2007 for the world championship tournament which was won by Anand. And Anand's next challengers were Topalov, Gerfand and Carlsen. Carlsen beat Anand and became the 16th official and undisputed world champion. Anand came back by winning Kanti Mansis 2014 for a rematch against Carlsen. Carlsen won again and Karyakin and Kairana were Carlsen's last two challengers. They both only lost in the tiebreak. So who will it be? Yekat Rienberg 2020-2021. Vachela Graf and Nepomnichy are leading the tournament halfway. As said, in this video we're going to look at the candidate cycle, which 
ended with Nigel Short qualifying to challenge Kasparov for the world title. The interzonal for that cycle was held in Manila on the Philippines in 1990 and for the first time the interzonal was held as a Swiss system tournament. It was held in June and July 1990. 64 contestants played 13 rounds and the top 11 qualified for the candidates tournament. The final four players from the previous cycle, Karpov, Timan, Yusupov and Spielman were seeded directly into the candidates. And the 11 qualifiers from the interzonal were Gelfand, Ivanchuk, Anand, Short, Sachs, Kochnoi, Hübner, Nikolic, Yudasin, Dolmatov and Dreyev. And that led to the following bracket for the candidates matches. Timon beat Hübner, Kochnoi beat Sachs, Yusupov beat Dolmatov, Ivanchuk beat Yudasin, Short beat Spielman. That was a revenge for the previous cycle where Spielman had beaten Short. Gelfand overcame Nikolic, Anand destroyed Dreyev and Karpov had a bye in that first round. In the quarterfinals, Timon beat Kochnoi, Yusupov beat Ivanchuk, that was a surprise, Short beat Gelfand and Karpov narrowly overcame Anand. In the semi-finals, Timon beat Yusupov and the big shock, Short beat Karpov. And that led to the final between Jan Timon from the Netherlands and Nigel Short from England. As you can see, Short won. And we're going to look at a crucial game from that match. We're going to look at game 9. The score is 4 points all. The match was over 14 games. White was Jan Timon with a rating of 26.35 and black was Nigel Short with a rating of 26.55. We are in San Lorenzo de El Escorial in Spain and Timon opened with the e-pawn in game 9. e5, knight f3, knight c6. We have a Rui Lopez, a6 and Timon plays the exchange variation. D takes, castling and here queen d6 was played in game 7 of this match, so two games earlier. And that game ended in a disaster for short. He lost that game. F6 is another move. It's one of the main lines as indicated by Grandmaster John van der Wiel in the matchbook that I'm using for this video. I'm using van der Wiel's analysis. In the game, knight e7 was played by short and van der Wiel calls it a good practical sidestep. Black wants to develop the knight to g6 and thus protect the e-pawn that way. Before he could do that, Timon took the e-pawn and now queen d4 attacking the knight and the pawn to win back the pawn that he just lost on e5. You can play knight f3 and then black regains the pawn on e4, but in the game after queen d4, Timon played queen h5. And van der Wiel calls this the most interesting and best option to get an opening advantage. Timon had played this move before, so short knew this continuation. White is threatening now to take on f7. So g6 is logical, attacking the queen and queen g5, threatening queen f6 with an attack on the rook and again on f7. So bishop g7 was played by short and now you can play knight f3. That knight is hanging on e5, queen takes e4, rook e1, it looks dangerous. We are attacking the knight with two pieces, but you can play Queen b4 and a knight on e7 is sufficiently protected. So that after bishop g7 the move from the game and then saving the knight with knight f3. But in the game Timon went to d3 with the knight. And now queen takes e4 is possible as well. Winning the pawn back but it's more risky for black than on the previous move. Rook e1 and then h6 has to be played. Risky for black. In the game after knight d3, short did not take on e4, he played f5. e5, c5, and now b3, and that move gets an exclamation mark from Grandmaster van der Wiel. It looks like a blunder. Is that rook not just hanging in the corner? Well, it is not, because if you take it, then there is knight c3, and that is good for white. On the next move, white will play either bishop b2 or bishop a3, and black will have to take on f1. Give the queen for that rook and that way white will get the queen for two rooks and white will have the initiative that will be better for white. So after b3 it is not good to take on a1. Short saw that and he kicked the queen with h6. Here queen e3 is the most common move because we're still in theory but Timon played the queen to g3. 
f4, kicking the queen again. Queen stepped aside and bishop f5, the sharpest option, which gets an exclamation mark from Grandmaster von der Riel. Yes, white can now take on b7, and that's what Timon did, which was in fact a new move prepared by Timon and his second Grandmaster, Jeroen Piquet, for the match. Instead of taking on b7, bishop b2 is the alternative. But Timon took on b7, attacking the rook in the corner, bishop e4, protecting that rook, and queen takes c7. White has now three extra pawns. And it's still not good to take on a1, because of bishop b2, queen takes a2, and knight c3, and that traps the queen on a2. So after queen takes c7, Short did not take on a1, he took on d3. Timon recaptured, and now bishop takes e5, attacking the queen. Queen b7, rook b8, and queen takes a6. And now black can take on a1. Queen takes a1 is possible, it was not played, but this is the rook sacrifice Timon had prepared in his training camp. Short said after the game that he thought he could have taken on a1, but that he trusted Timon's preparation and decided not to go for it. The variations that Grandmaster van der Wiel gives are crazy. In one of the variations, white has a queen and five pawns for two rooks and a knight. I will not go into those variations in this video. In the game, Short played a different move to sidestep Timon's variations. Instead of taking the rook, accepting the rook sacrifice, he played f4, f3, and is now going after white's king. Knight c3, and you can play queen g4, that is threatening mate, on g2. But there is queen a4 check, and that's a nice move. Because it is check, and attacking the queen, you have to swap the queens, and that is the end of black's attack. After the move from the game knight c3, you can also consider taking on h2, with check. Short had seen that, but it leads only to a draw. King takes, queen h4 check, king g1, f takes g2, threatening checkmate on h1, so you have to take, and then there is a perpetual check, like this. That will lead to a draw. Short saw that, but he did not want to resign himself to the draw yet. And after knight c3, he did not play queen g4, he did not take on h2, he played f takes g2. You cannot take that pawn, because then black wins, queen g4 check, king h1, and queen h3. With checkmate on h2, nothing that white can do against that. So after f takes g2, Timon did not take it, he played rook e1, saving the rook. Castling from short on move 20, and it's now threatening checkmate on f2. With queen and rook, Timon played queen e6 check and rook f7. Black has compensation for the two pawns he is down. He has very active pieces while white's queen side is still undeveloped and the mate in one threat on f2 is still there. Rook e2 is an option. It was not played. It is given by the engine and also by Grandmaster van der Wiel who did not have an engine back in 1993 when he analyzed this game. But Timon decides to sacrifice an exchange. Instead of rook e2 he played knight d1. It's protecting against a checkmate, but now finally the rook in the corner gets taken. Timon took on e5, queen takes, rook takes, and we have transposed into an endgame where white has two pawns for the exchange and objectively the position is equal. Knight c6, rook takes c5, knight b4, and here bishop b2 was expected by short, and then knight takes d3, Rook c6 with dynamic equality. This game should end in a draw. But in the game after knight b4, Timon did not play bishop b2. He played bishop a3. And that move gets a question mark. Because of knight takes d3, attacking the rook. Rook c6 and rook a8. Attacking the bishop on a3. And here a variation given by van der Wiel is that you can take on g6 with check. Taking a pawn with check, always good. But after king h7, you have to make sure you go to g3. And this game still should end in a draw. Don't go to d6 instead, because now we see black's threats. Knight f4, 
And if you save the bishop, for example, bishop c5, there is rook g7 with checkmate threats on e2 and on h3. Black wins in all variations. So that's something that Timon had to look out for and not fall in that trap. And that is why he did not take on g6 with check. He played rook d6 straight away, attacking the knight. The engine likes knight f4 here. That's the best move, but short decides to take on a3, take the bishop. Timon took the piece on d3, and short wins a pawn, rook takes a2. Here knight c3 was given by Timon as a better chance to achieve a draw. He wants to put the knight on e4. This endgame is very difficult. Van der Wiel estimated that white has about a 60% chance to hold a draw after knight c3. But in the game, Timon played his knight to e3, and that's not as strong. King g7, and knight c4 is the move here. Short gave this move, as it is then more difficult for black to become active with his rooks. In the game, Timon took on g2, and now black's rooks will become very strong. Rook e5, that move would not have been possible with the knight on c4. Rook d4 and rook b5 attacking the b-pawn. b4 to protect that pawn and rook f to b7 seems very logical but then there is knight c2 protecting the b4 pawn a second time and it's hard for black to make progress. Short understood that and instead of playing rook f to b7 he played rook b to b7. Great endgame play from the Englishman. Rook c4, rook f to c7 and Timon decides to keep the rooks on the board. After a rook trade, black will eventually win one of white's pawns, after which the position must be a win for black. Rook d7, and here you can play knight f1, hanging on for dear life, just trying to protect the pawns and let black prove that he has the technique to make progress. Timon did not play that tenacious move, he played h4 instead, and that move gets a question mark from Grandmaster van der Wiel. h5, rook g5, and that b-pawn is now lost. You can play d4, tactically protecting that d-pawn, because if you take it, that would be a big mistake. Taking with the other rook would be the same. And why, if you want to put a video on pause, what is the refutation of this pawn grab? Put a video on pause and have a look for yourself, it's not very difficult. There is knight f5 check, and that is a fork, winning in exchange, and the g-pawn is pinned. King f6, the rook is protected on g5, so knight takes d4, rook takes d4, and this game will end in a draw after all. So after d4 you cannot take that pawn, short saw that, and played rook f7, and now the pawn on d4 is hanging, and all white pawns are weak. Rook d5 on the 39th move, but after rook b2, Jan Timon resigned the game. The f2 pawn is now hanging, you can try and protect it with knight d1, but it doesn't work because there is rook d2 kicking the knight away, and after knight e3, rook f takes f2 check. Black is a full axe change up, and will win this game. With this win, Short regained the lead in the match. It was now 5-4 in his favor, and this loss with White must have come as a big blow to Timon, especially as he lost the game from a variation he had prepared in his training camp before the match. Short won the next game as well, and in the end won the match after 13 games by 7.5 to 5.5, and, and gained the right to challenge world champion Gary Kasparov for the world title later that year. Kasparov and Shore decided to play that match outside of the World Chess Federation FIDE, which meant that Timon got a World Championship match after all against Karpov. But that is a whole different story. The story which I told in a series I made on all World Championship matches. The link to that video is up here. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you will keep counting down towards the resumption of the Canada's tournament with me. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, please subscribe to the Chess to Impress channel and please leave a comment. I will read them all and I will reply to them all. If you liked the video, it would be great if you could share it on social media by clicking the share button on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, on Twitter and on Facebook. This is Rick for Chess to Impress. Thank you for watching.